Our first guest drew national attention back in September when he was arrested. It was in regards to a land dispute in the Caledonia area. We are joined now by journalist Carl Dockstader. He's the co-host uh, of a, a program called One Dish, One Mic on CKTB Radio. Carl, welcome to The Source. Thanks for having me. So let's talk, first of all, about this dispute at 1492 Landback Lane in the Caledonia area. How did it come about that you were arrested? There were Haudenosaunee land defenders that in July had, uh, it was the 11th hour for a development that was going to happen. The Six Nations Elected Council had given an accommodation. The traditional chiefs are blanket opposed to these types of developments. So some land defenders took it upon themselves to move onto the territory. My co-host and I, Sean and I, we drove up the next day, we met them, uh, started talking to them, uh, pitched some story ideas with them, talked about, about uh, understanding why they were there, and we, we kept sort of coming in and out and doing quick stories. What I really wanted though was an opportunity to immerse myself at the camp, so I spent a week at the camp in the last week of August. Everything was fine until I got a call a couple days after I'd been there from the police letting me letting me know that they were intending to arrest me and, and then I had to come back up to the Cayuga OPP detachment. You were clearly there as a journalist. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was I was making video. I talked to Tom McConnell from, from 610 CKTV on, on the Tuesday. Uh, I, I filed a story afterwards immediately. I was filing video video updates. So And I was pretty clear about, about delineating the, the role that I had there. How did they feel justified to warn you of this arrest? Well, I think it's a slippery slope for me to speak on behalf of the police. Of course. So I, I, I asked, though, and that you know that's that's the thing. Like I clarified that, hey, I'm a member of the media. I'm a journalist. I, I explained that as as I was there, I had an interaction with the police the week that I was there. Handed them my card with all my media contact information on it. Uh, explained it to the to the officer when she called me up to notify me of the arrest. And and so I thought I had taken all of the appropriate measures. So I'm not I'm not sure how how they justified it. You're a member of the Oneida, Oneida, is that yep. how I pronounce yep. it? Oneida, Oneida of Thames, yep. of Thames uh, Bear Clan. Yep. Do you feel that if you weren't an indigenous person that you may have not been arrested in that I, case? I don't think I would have been arrested if, if I weren't indigenous. There uh, have not been a lot of reporters that, that were willing to do the immersive style that, that I wanted to do to really embed themselves with the leadership. But I, I don't think it's a coincidence at all that I look like the land defenders and that all of a sudden I have charges like the 30 plus people that are dealing with charges now. What did it feel like when you had to go back to your family and, and, and tell them the information that you were facing charges of mischief and failure to comply? Like it was devastating. It was hard. Like it, I, don't, I don't judge people having worked in the court system myself for a period of time and, and having done advocacy through the Friendship Center. Like, I don't judge people that, that have charges. I know now how easy it is for an Indigenous person to get charges. But honestly, I still, I still felt ashamed having to go back to my family and, and my parents who, who have educations themselves and, and tried to raise me right and, and to have to tell them. And then, but then especially my daughters. Like, they're just, they're just as a stereotype around Indigenous men and criminality that's all too pervasive. So having to tell my, my two young daughters, my, my 10 and, and at the time 12-year-old, that, uh, that I had these charges, it, it, it broke my heart. And I think it broke their hearts a little bit when I told them. How much did they understand about the dispute itself on the land? Well, they, they knew a lot about the dispute because we've been covering it pretty, pretty extensively. And then being Oneida ourselves, I mean, Oneidas are one of the Six Nations. So, so they're very, I've raised them to be very familiar with causes that, that affect Indigenous people. So it, it was my oldest daughter that right away connected it to systemic racism. Like she used the word racism when, when I told her about my arrest. In speaking to your daughters at 10 and 12 years old about the dispute and about your arrest, do you reflect on it and do you, do you hope that they don't take this as a warning against being an activist in their lives as Indigenous women? I think it shows them the stakes of intervening in a situation that needs to be intervened in. And I think it's important for them at a young age to, to understand that this is, this is a risk that Indigenous people have, that I just don't think is the same for non-Indigenous people. You're, you were eventually cleared of the charges. It took until late December, I believe, yep. for those charges to be thrown away. How did that feel? 
It was still bittersweet. Like it, uh, we have uh, another prominent indigenous member of the Niagara community that, that was charged. I have I have personal friends that, that I know that are associated with this movement that are charged. And and honestly, uh, when when I was covering the movement, I mean, a lot of the coverage that, that I've done through One Dish, One Mike, and a lot of the writing that I've done has exposed how skewed the system is against indigenous people. So, so I didn't, honestly, I didn't have much time to celebrate uh, my own personal situation because I was very mindful of how this is still affecting Indigenous people. Besides running the podcast, you are also involved in the community. Um, you took on a new role as uh, Executive Director of the Niagara Regional Native Centre. Uh, when did that start and um, how do you see your role evolving? How do you manage the, the two things, the radio show and maybe your activism, throw that in there as well with your role as Executive Director of the Centre? So I've been I've been the executive director now of the Niagara Regional Native Center for for just coming up to two months. Uh, it's it's amazing how much crossover there is between advocacy, activism, journalism, and even working at a friendship center. Friendship centers exist because the status quo was broken for Indigenous people. Indigenous people came to the cities and they had to give up a lot of the rights that they had being protected on the reserve, and then they came to cities with nothing, and then had to give up rights compared to the people that were already established here. So this movement acknowledged that there was a lot of systemic racism in the, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the heyday of the movement, but, but unfortunately there's still a lot of that now. So it's important for me to be well versed in the issues that affect Indigenous people, and that served me well in, in advocacy work, and in journalism, and now in leading a friendship center. The Truth and Reconciliation brought light to a lot of the issues facing Indigenous people. School boards now, and the Ministry of Education is really pushing Indigenous education. I know uh, the DSBN uh, does really well, and so does the Niagara Catholic. They have hired Indigenous people to head up those, those efforts. Do those kinds of things make you see some promise? Yeah, I like, I really like our school boards and I really like what the DSP, my daughters are, are in the DSBN uh, and community members have their kids in the Niagara Catholic District School Board, uh, Brian Kahn, uh, Gary Parker, Jamie Grout, like they're, they're a whole team of people, I, I risk leaving people out by naming names, but they're, they're really people that I believe are dedicated to the welfare of our children in those systems and they are using things like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as a framework and that, that's always been my hope is that if the kids can have it better than we have it, then we're doing okay. As long as they can have less barriers than what we have. It's not gonna be fixed in, in a generation or two, but, but we have to start somewhere. And so starting with the young people makes sense. Two months into your role as executive director, what do you see as your goals over the next year, maybe over the next five years? It, it's difficult in a time of pandemic. Uh, we are an essential service provider, so, and. If there's one thing, I think, I think it's apparent that we can see with a lot of the data that it's the people in the margins in society who are most affected by COVID-19. So right now my role is crucial to make sure that we're fulfilling our responsibilities as an essential service provider, and that, and that I'm, but that I'm still protecting my staff too. So it's, it's a fine line because I'm asking people to go and to give their all, but then they're also very willing to do it because they, they, you have to have a big heart to work at a friendship center. But I have to strike that balance between encouraging people to use their big hearts to help people, but then also to make sure that they're protecting themselves. So that's our challenge right now. In, in the longest term, we have to continue to fight for equity for indigenous people. We're, we're doing better than the generations before us, but the generations coming after us still need us to fight as hard as we can to, to bring us back up to the level of non-indigenous communities. Carl, I want to take this uh, moment as, uh, as we close our interview today to uh, congratulate you on your CBC Indigenous Fellowship, and uh, that's, that's a huge honor. Um, and I do want to mention that your podcast, One Dish, One Mike, is Sundays on CKTB, 10 a.m. till noon. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Mike.